What's up, guys? This is David, a.k.a. Reverse Long. Today, I have the pleasure of having Del the Trader on the podcast. So Del the Trader uh, is is a, a podcast host, author, uh, trader, and we're going to see what else he's been up to these days. But, like, you know, I got introduced to Del when um he was on Steady Trade podcast back with Tim Bowen. This must have been uh, before the podcast started. We, we talked about it for a second. I thought in my mind, uh, my memory, I thought it was 2020. But no, that was like 2018, apparently. Um, and yeah, so when he was on there, he had a podcast called Bear versus Pig. And I was getting into the shorting and like the piggies flying and stuff. So it's like I started, you know, like as you're deep diving and I would consume podcasts, you know. So this is way before I even was a profitable trader, way before I even started Friendly Bear. This is way before no one even knew who I was. Instagram, no pro social media, nothing. It's just like I'm just consuming podcasts. And I love this idea that that uh, bear versus pig and th that podcast was really well done. Um, and then and, you know, I was consuming steady trade, Dell the trader, chat with traders, everything, everything podcasting. Then in the future, I started Friendly Bear and I always loved the intro that uh, Dell had with the bear versus pig. And that's why I don't know if Dell, if you, if you saw my intro, my intro was inspired a little bit by yours. It's like it's like a serious and you're like the. You know, it's like it's it's uh sounds kind of scary, like the dramatic, pigs. yeah, dramatic, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, with all that being said, what's up, Dell? How's it going? Great, great, David. Thank you so much for having me on. Um, I can see you're making the waves, and I'm really uh, excited to be on your podcast. Thanks, man. Thanks. Well, you know, um, I got it. You know, it's like when I started the Friendly Bear, I had a couple different podcasts in mind. So, like, I uh that inspired me it was a. Uh, Steady trade, Dell the trader. Uh, what is it? This week in steady trade, the the reviews that steady trade did. Uh, you know, with all the the, the guys in there, and uh, chat with traders. So yeah, yours was one of those. Um, I want to see what you've been up to these days, as far as uh, podcasting or trading, or how's all that going? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I think uh, after that steady trade interview, honestly, you know, it was right before COVID, and. I feel like that was a lifetime ago. It was so hard to even imagine what happened before COVID. But yeah, before COVID, I was working on podcasting. Um, I was doing a lot of active trading in the piggy space. Um, started moving a little bit more towards investing and longer term sort of swing trading. Um, at the time, you know, things were weren't looking great. I think for um, for small caps and for um, um otcs or piggies uh, i think we were having some volume issues i think we we're having some market participant issues with all the hype that came with uh with reddit and everything um but i think like um you no know, after that i decided to take some time off and just take care of my family i had a i had a daughter she's um five now and yeah i've just been focusing on um i switched over from from trading on a day-to-day -day basis every morning to managing my family fund. And I've been actually growing that fund and uh, my trading has changed dramatically in terms of what I trade, but I've really refined what I used to do back in the piggy days and the bear versus pig days. Um, those Twitter, crazy Twitter days. And um, I've applied it to a sort of a much longer timeline. Gotcha. So interesting. So now you're doing a family fund and you're doing a longer timeline and swing trades, it sounds like. Um, so that takes me back, man. So 2018, because like this is a totally different era. Like it's like almost like before COVID and after COVID or before <laughs> pandemic, after pandemic. So pig piggies is what it was popular back then to call them that. Right. These are like like flying uh, pigs, like <laughs> right. Like they would. Uh, that's what you can cons like consider it's like the small caps like going uh, high. Right. What, what you would normally call a um, sort of spiked volume, um, you know, trading off the charts on random uh, news releases, getting dumped hard, pumped and dump, pump and dumps are inside of that category as well. Uh, and basically, you're only shorting. And so, and so when I started Bear versus Pig, it was in an attempt a very desperate attempt to try and figure out exactly what I was doing wrong in my strategy and what, what I saw some of the best traders in, in the area um, were doing right. And 
you know, I, I, I made friends during that podcast. Um, I made friends with um, um, a few people from Seven Points Capital. Um, I made friends with uh, J Trader um, and uh, a bunch of other people uh, in the space. In the space that you know, too many to name. Um, but everyone was sort of working together to try and figure out when was the best time to short these things. How were we shorting them? Why were they being um, sold off so hard? And uh, how could we ride that? piggy all the way down <laughs> into oblivion essentially gotcha yeah so i'm it takes me back okay so right now uh seems like there's a lot of shorts like overcrowded there's like so many brokers that do it now so back then which is not even that long ago but but like it was a d completely different it was um but you you were saying that you left the space because uh the liquidity issues like it was just like mm -hmm. it wasn't as many opportunities back then yeah, so I think one of the biggest issues that I had with the space was um, everyone was going after the same names, um, which is great if you're trading in the same direction. Um, but I think one of the, the problems that we ran into uh, was, A, the trading fees were enormous in that space. Uh, the amount of volume that you trade uh, versus the reward is a lot of the time upside down. Um, and it was really hard for me to apply my, uh, what I call market auction theory, uh, sort of technical analysis, uh, type of trading to something that had such a short time frame, And it was mostly based off of press releases. Uh, I came from the world of futures trading. Um, I spent, um, a lot of time in futures in, in the world of order flow in, you know, trading right off the book. Uh, right off the tape and from there moving into something like piggies was um, a big commitment in terms of risk uh, it didn't have the, the same um, the same swings that futures did and the pace was a lot higher and so I, I think I really struggled struggled a lot to achieve consistency um, and so I, I moved away from that primarily for that reason uh, but then also there was that that movement in in how volatility was being spread across um, the industry as a whole. I think, you know, when when the Reddit thing happened that exploded, um, it really sort of underscored a lot of the issues inside of that um, inside of that trading space. Where yeah, there was a lot of new traders, um, but they were you know usually fighting against the trend and uh, the there was a lot of um, uh, algorithmic trading at the same time. And so I would work with Bookmap, one of my favorite programs when that came out. And Bookmap was all about the order flow. And so I'd pull up these names on Bookmap and just check out the volume and what's going on inside of, inside of the names. And there was every single day at 9.45, a program would run on most of these names that were being shorted by all the same people that would essentially um, do things like spoof, uh, spoof price um, at key levels. Um, it was highly, I think high, like very large institutional sort of money coming in and being um, spoofed fairly quickly. Um, they would do all sorts of old school, I guess, like order flow techniques in the algos. Um, and I found it really hard to decipher what was real, what was the the psychology of the market participants, and um, which is something that I, I could exploit, and what was more of like a program that was just running. And I think it got a lot blurrier for me as the market changed and um, the volatility across that sort of um, that market changed. I think completely with with the way that um, uh, that the participants changed. Oh, so interesting. So, so Reddit, you're you're referring to like 2021, early 2021, with the GameStop and AMC, and attracted a lot of those kind of that crowd, right? Is that what that was about? the that was the peak of it. So you talk, was so Reddit was saw, going on before? No, no, we we saw we saw sort of the market changing in that end. We saw like the, the uh, spacs coming out in the market. We saw, um, um, uh, we had the 
the Trump election that came through and that's right. Uh, in 2019, we had um, a lot of fear in the market, which is generally a good thing. Um, but everything started trading the same way I found, and I, I had a hard time understanding why. Uh, and so I took to the order flow, and in the order flow, that's where I saw what I what I thought to be. And you know, me and J Trader, I think, dove into it a little bit. <laughs> um, we saw programs that were running, and uh, we saw opportunities to try and short the market based off of programs. And for me, this, this is where I sort of lost it a little bit. And I said, there's got to be a better place. And so I turned to options trading at the time. I see. Now, now the book map, uh, so you were able to spot. I haven't, I haven't used book map. I, I'm aware of it. I know about it. And I, and I watch videos on it about other traders using it. Um, but like, I've never used it myself. But I'm, I'm curious. Okay, I never heard. So you're able to see like orders uh, and determine kind of like, okay, this, this might be like an algo. You're able to like detect a like a little bit of because the of the orders and like the way the book map presents it, like the with the um, visuals, you're able to see, okay, this is not natural. This is like, you're able to see that much clearer on book map. Yeah. Well, we, I think everyone knows that like back in 2019 anyway, I think there was, what was around 70% of the market was algorithmic. Uh, usually those are re really small programs. Uh, usually they're just like, you know, uh, taking advantage of the spread and it's nothing nothing huge. Um, but the larger programs, when they step in, you can really see it. It's like, imagine seeing, so book map, book map shows you two things. It shows you um, orders that have been uh, accepted on the market, right? So you place an order, that's an order that hasn't been accepted on the market yet. It's just a, a floating order. And then once the market trades through that order, then it becomes um, part of the historical volume of the of the market, and so there's two sides, right? There's the intent, and then there's a commitment. And so the on the intent side, you can see orders being placed, you know, like 100 ticks above price or 100 ticks below price. And so we would see at nine between 9:30 and 9:45, machine gun orders coming in on large size, and it literally looks like a stepping ladder boom 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 under price pushing wow. price up and these are very large orders and a lot of the time they're not getting filled on these orders what they're doing is they're spoofing all of the other algos on the market they're spoofing mm. anyone else that's looking at the at the tape yeah at the order at the order flow i should say um and it's it's a way to manipulate markets and so there's a few techniques that they use one of them's uh spoofing the other one is like the ladder sort of technique that I, that I just, uh, the other one, and the other one's like these large block trades um, that are placed. So maybe, a, I don't know, a hundred lot or something like that is, is placed somewhere underneath the market. And then as soon as price comes in within what seems to be a, a standard deviation of price, boom, automatically um, a, a portion of that large block gets thrown right onto the bid or right into the ask. Um, and so on and so forth. And so you can really see that the pattern yeah. and it was very pronounced inside of these piggies. Um, there was a lot of market manipulation in, in, on that end. Wow. So, um, yeah, as you, as you're, as you're, uh, mentioning that, like some, uh, traumatic trades are popping through my heads. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, the old man is bringing it back, but, uh, so it's, it, it's, it's gotten even more dramatic now, you know, as far as like the the, the aggressiveness and uh, you know the size and like yeah, the spoofing has gone out, out of hand. So um, with the algos. So so anyways, a little a little background on yourself. Okay, so you mentioned futures. So how did you get started with trading, and how did it uh, turn into piggies and to what it is now ultimately? Oh wow, that was such a long time ago, man. Um, yeah, I think I started in I don't even remember my own story anymore. Like 2012, 2013. Um, and I started in Forex. Um, I, I loved anything to do with like just the market and people going at it in terms of price. And so I got deep into, um, into, into just trying to figure out, um, sw uh, swing trading. And, um, I didn't do so well on Forex at all. I blew up a couple of accounts. These are small, like 
a couple grand. But at the time, that was all the money in the world to me. And then um, from there, I moved into futures when I realized that the world of order flow and volume analysis was alive only inside of futures. They, they had the volume. They had essentially what ran as 24-7 markets at the time, uh, almost depending on, on where you trade. And uh, it was accessible to me in Canada and to be able to trade that way and pretty cheap. Uh, and so, um, yeah, that's where I sort of cut my teeth, I guess, on market analysis, on um, order flow trading. Uh, that's where I, I learned uh, auction market theory, uh, AMT, through uh, Livermore's books and the Wyckoff methods and all that sort of stuff. And, um, and then I was hungry for uh, volatility because one of the things inside of trading futures was you had to you know, wake up early and then the first 30 minutes of trading is the most important and the rest of the day is based off of news, but uh, nowhere as exciting as stocks. Um, and so the range and the expectancy in terms of value was not as high. Um, and then uh, I discovered, I think through podcasts as well, to tell you the truth. I don't remember which podcast it was, but I consumed a lot, sort of like how you did. Uh, and it brought me to this world of of, uh, of pump and dumps. And I thought yeah. to myself, there's a code. <laughs> yeah. I can solve it. Yeah. And uh, and so I, I, yeah, I dug in there and I tried to apply my auction market theory, my AMT type style trading and analysis to that market. Um, but yeah, it's like square peg, round hole type thing. <laughs> so uh, I did I did learn a lot and I, I've developed since then a new form of trading, which I'd like to get into uh, a little bit with you because I haven't really talked to anybody about it since I've stopped doing um, my, um, I guess, public sort of... Uh, uh, podcasts and things. Um, but from there, after that, I, I, um, I, I went into options trading um, because options is, is more like, imagine, you know, all these large cap stocks that we don't really want to trade because they move kind of slow. They have underlying options that are, each one of them acts as if they were a small cap or, or OTC or, or piggy. And the the volume there is there. It's it's massive a lot of the time on these uh, stocks, and it's very predictable. And all of these market theories work inside of the world of options um, as well. So, and it's a, a really great way of managing your risk because when you lose, uh, when you when you buy an option, you can't ever lose more than what you bought it for. And the fees are maybe a fraction of what they were inside of trading stocks. Uh, so. Um, that's where I moved, and then and then after that, I, I got more into um, into into crypto. Interesting. So so with the options, I remember when I was uh, learning trading, there was one uh, one trader I learned from uh, Mark Crook. Shout out to Mark mm. Crook. Um, he would use, and I, I think he stopped doing it, or at least he stopped mentioning it. But um, he would use put options as a form of shorting uh, small caps it's because some of the small cap stocks are optionable. So is that kind of like what you're referring to? But this is a put. It's not not like buying it. And uh, you were like, I guess, date it out. If it's a pump and dump, you date, you know, you put it way out there. But then I, I don't trade options, but I'm assuming there's like time decay or it's it's a lot harder than what it seems. Because like <laughs> in my head, I'm like, oh, it's a pump and dump. Just It's, it's going to die like in a year. Just put it way <laughs> out there. Yeah. If you take a look at my Twitter feed, feed and scroll back a bit, you'll see me trading these um large caps and mid cap stocks um you know whatever's hot a, a lot of uh, i think mu was one of them that i traded a lot uh, but i never traded the underlying i always traded the options uh, and i would trade you know short like a week out or so uh smash the bid is the one that turned me on to this so one of the one of the people that turned right. me on to this yeah, i've had yeah, him on yeah you had smash on yeah yeah, yeah yeah i saw him on your list it's on my list to watch actually um and uh, yeah, Smash is awesome. Smash, is, Smash has got like such a great personality, as you know. Um, and so like the, what I really loved about options in trading that way was um, every week there was like a new set of stocks that were being released. And the last three days were the highest volatility. People were scaling out of their, of their positions and it's when they move the fastest. And so you'd have an option that went from like two cents 
to like 70 cents. Uh, and I mean, we're talking about percentages. Those are huge, massive moves. If you can buy one of these at the right price, uh, you're laughing at the end of the day. And so uh, I did that quite a bit. I used um, interactive brokers here in Canada to trade them. Uh, it was a dollar a trade and it was beautiful and there was no fees. <laughs> so wow, it was great. Okay. Yeah. And then you said you mentioned crypto. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, so how's was, crypto, man? <laughs> I was an early crypto investor. I started in 2020. Oh, so you're you're like a trillionaire then? No, I you're, wish. You're... <laughs> I, I've definitely made more money in crypto than anywhere else. I'll, I'll, I'll say that. Um, and I definitely just had my, the largest trade of my career on crypto. And um, oh, congrats, bought, man! Thank you. It was amazing. I'm still I'm still not digesting it, or it, it's still it's still out there and not. <laughs> uh, not undigested. Um, and so I started in 2013. I bought Bitcoin and I sold it after a month because it was... But hold on I, a second. I, I never understood this. So like in 2013, what gets someone to buy Bitcoin? Because I had a college <laughs> roommate that did it, but he never explained it to me. Like, yeah. like, oh, like what convinced you to buy it? Like what got you in? Like who told you about it to put to put money in? And I'm sure you... you, you, you how, like... um. Were you in school or like you, you're probably a lot younger. No, so I was like, working. I was working. Um, you didn't have that much money on the side. I imagine. Cause you said Forex, you had like a $2,000 account. That was a world of money. <laughs> so like with Bitcoin, like, you know, so, so who I bought $3,000 worth of Bitcoin. It was a, it was, I don't remember exactly how much. Is that a big expense was. for you at the time? Yeah, it was. So a you lot were, so what convinced you to put that down? Cause like, you gotta be really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I, I was sort of um, I was sort of really into the idea of of how um, um, our our monetary system was like upside down and backwards. But who told and you about I, it? Like you did your own research online at the time. I guess the internet was uh, good back then. Yeah, I know. I was I was I was a techie. I, I work in tech. Okay, and okay. So, so I had I had some developer that was telling me about it. I think <laughs> at one point. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, I, don't, I was like, I don't know. And then and then I looked into it, and I'm like, this could potentially be a new, a replacement for the U.S. dollar. I, I want in on it, and it was okay. all very conspiracy theory type stuff. And that's why. And it, that's it, how it, you got nothing in. else okay. to stand on it. Yeah. But yeah, then yeah. after about a month, when the price went. Uh, from from where I bought it, which is at like seventy dollars, to like it went to like a hundred hundred and twenty dollars. So so and back it, then, what did you yeah. think was best case scenario? Well, like a dream scenario, like a hundred bucks. I, I thought a hundred bucks was incredible. I thought maybe if it goes to two hundred dollars. <laughs> I'm going to sell yeah. it. I mean, it's like anything else. It's just if yeah, yeah, yeah. You never imagined something's going to go that big. Nobody yeah. did. And yeah. and anyone that tells you that they they saw it coming from all the way back is probably lying so <laughs> it's more like it's more like they they managed to hold on to it either because they forgot about it or they're really good at uh, yeah yeah and yeah. you had to store it if That's you kept a, yeah your money in mount gox which is where i had my money in mount gox mount, mount gox, gox was the biggest what? it was the biggest crypto in, exchange in the world it was in uh, japan and it completely crashed and stole everybody's crypto oh man i think they still have some of my crypt my my bitcoin but i just don't remember so wait wait you you had how, like a lot of that amount, the three thousand dollars was in Mount Gox. Yeah, but I sold all of it. I think oh, maybe okay, after okay. about a about a month when it crashed from one hundred and twenty dollars back down to like sixty, fifty, forty, and I was like, I'm getting out of this. I think I made like three grand, which is pretty great actually. I like doubled yeah. my money at the time, um, or maybe a little less than that. And then um, in 2017, uh, I realized, you know. Actually, this crypto thing keeps going. Uh, Ethereum came out. Uh, I work in Toronto, and so in Toronto, mm. we had we had um, Vitalik that actually had the first sort of announcement of Ethereum in Toronto, uh, not too far away from where I worked. And I was like, okay, I'm going to get into this thing. And uh, I ended up buying a bunch of it. I bought, I think, thirty thousand dollars worth of um, of uh, of miners of uh, of uh, video cards, and I set up miners in my basement. And I just started mining all this stuff. So you were mining crypto. Yeah. And from in 2017, 2017 to like 2019, I mined what, crypto. What does that look like? Like you have like uh, uh, 20 computers down there and you're just like <laughs> hanging out. It's like, it's my wife really, thought I was insane. And it's like really hot. You need like coolers and stuff. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. I built them all by, <laughs> by from scratch. It sounds I built crazy, them all man. By from scratch. Yeah, the whole thing. I built them, built. I built the everything. I did, I did all of the installation, all the management of it. I had new lines drawn up in my basement just for those yeah. crypto machines. And then, uh, and so, then I was so, just hot there. So, I, man, it's so interesting because I was at a Bitcoin conference in 2021 and they had like all this like Bitcoin mining stuff. It looked like portables and, and like you can coolers and all this. So, so you built that, you built that kind of stuff yourself like that and using like fans and, and like, yeah. How much money does that cost? It probably cost me around forty forty thousand dollars for the so. for the mine. And then, what is mining anyway? I never understood it. It's like it's not like like your hard hat and like going down there, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I don't know why they call it mining. It's uh, it's uh, it's it's video cards using their computational power to solve uh, algorithms, and what it spits out is um a reward for solving the algorithm and you're solving the algorithm for a long chain of other people that are solving the same algorithm and so the is... more it's it's, an, it's it can never be fully solved i don't think uh and eventually it's gonna be so hard to solve that it won't be able to spit out any more uh crypto and so that's that's the incentive of it see so so bitcoin is being produced like new bitcoin is being like printed out of thin air yeah china is doing a ton a ton of mining. I think uh, it's getting more and more expensive uh, in in terms of everything, energy, time, I effort. So it's and not so really you, worth it as much as you it can't was do it in before. your basement anymore. And in I 2017, see. you could definitely do it in your basement. Now, I don't, I don't think you can. I mean, you you could, but you're not going to get much. So, it's how expensive. difficult are these are these problems? Are you like a math whiz? Uh, or like no, that? no. It's 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 just a it's just a program that you run on these um on these machines and um they run 24 7 and every once in a while you get lucky and you get a coin you get you get rewarded with a coin for solving some so that's and you used to get a lot but now you don't get as many and so i, I totally stopped I that and by by 2020 i was done so so how long how many hours did you, would you hang out in the basement or you know <laughs> it was a it's definitely a pet project like most nights i'd be down there messing with it but i've been build, building computers since i was a kid so, I so was, interesting. I, was, I never uh, met a Bitcoin miner, like a, <laughs> <laughs> a crypto miner. Yeah, yeah. A crypto miner. So any other cryptos you have on watch or just you were always on Bitcoin and Ethereum or is that, is that was that it only? Or Oh, uh, no. The, I mean, if you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity for traders right now in, in the crypto space. Um, if you can sort of get past the whole fiat to crypto issue, trans, uh, transferring your money over. Um, then uh, really soon we're going to have more than just cryptos to invest in. We're going to have what they're calling now um, RWAs, a real real world asset. Uh, so BlackRock, they just bought, um, they just made some very large moves in this space, which is essentially tokenizing any type of asset in the world. And so instead of buying gold uh, on the, on uh, in physical gold right now, you can buy it um, on the stock market. And so, that asset is essentially just a digital version of gold, so you can invest in it, right? It's a, just an, an instrument. We're going to have the same thing in crypto, uh, where you'll buy um, like G Gold or whatever, or you could buy like G A P P L uh, E for or A P P L for uh, Apple, or whatever it is, or Amazon, um, and you can buy it inside of the crypto space without having to move your money into fiat. And so BlackRock's all over that. Coinbase is all over that, and there's um, a bunch of uh, projects in the crypto space that have their own tokens because everyone has their own token. Um, that is, uh, that are sort of leading the charge in that space, and so I think the world's going to look really different for traders. The opportunities are definitely there right now, um, but the amount of volume that is in the crypto space is mind blowing. Like, if if you ever wanted to trade against market participants and not not bots like cryptos are where you should be really because i always thought it was like infested with algorithms there's, there's no regulation there's just like the wild west of these algos like are on steroids because uh there's no regulation so it's like they can they can wash trade they can manipulate they can do it's like it's just like a uh, wild wild west that's what i i thought like uh, i i have 
I tried trading crypto. This is back in 2021. And but like, you know, that's that was my thoughts. I don't know if it's changed since then. What what do you think about that? Like the regulation, I think it it um it's easier to to trade against with with more regulation against algos, I think. I don't know. What 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 are your thoughts mm -hmm. on that? Any disagreement or what do you or the whole take um, I had on crypto? I guess we just don't really know. Um, there's definitely a lot of bots, but I don't know that the 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 large sort of um, institutional level bots are, are uh, algorithms, I, I should say, not bots, are active inside of these quote unquote small cap crypto names. Ah, uh, I see. I see. And so these like meme coins right now that are going crazy everywhere. Uh, these meme coins are essentially just little OTCs. And so sort of just like in, in the, in the stock, um, in the stock world, uh, if you have a stock that's trading under a dollar, um, then these large institutionals are not going to be buying it. They're just mm -hmm. not, it's just, it's just, they're not allowed to, I don't remember exactly why the regulation or maybe it just doesn't make any sense for them to do that. They're not doing it. And so they're, they're more in the larger caps and it's the same thing in crypto, but the, the inflow of volume and the inflow of market participants uh, is fresh. These are fresh to the world of trading participants is unlike what the world has ever seen before. And, and so there's tons of opportunity out there. Get your feet wet, put a hundred bucks in. You can divide that by, I don't know, how, however many times when you buy a token, um, but you can trade a little bit and see uh, how it feels for you. For me, um, on the technical side, it's definitely a lot more pure. It, it, uh, in terms of my setups, it gives me the cleanest outcomes. Uh, there's not as much noise. And the predictability is way up there for people that have been staring at markets for a long time, because at the end of the day, this is just fear or, or, or FOMO or whatever it is. And you can taste it um, if you're an experienced trader. So interesting. So interesting. So, so Dell, you mentioned uh, before the podcast started, you had a book that you're working on. So tell me about that. So tell us. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. Uh, look, I don't, I don't have a name for it yet. Uh, it started off as for bear versus pig. When I moved out of just interviews, I, I moved into more of like a Substack um, written sort of experience. And then I, I did uh, monologues for some of those um, for some of those essays that I was writing. Um, and while writing those um, I just couldn't stop at one point. And I thought, you know, the way I trade, I, I'm always, trying to explain to people the way I trade because it feels like it's so different. I'm not saying I'm special. I'm just saying, I think I trade a little bit differently than other people do. And um, I figured, you know what, it's maybe it's time to just keep going on these essays and see if I can turn it into anything that makes sense in terms of a book. And so it's, um, it's, it's sort of a, 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 a departure from the traditional um, auction market theory um, I'm calling it modern auction theory. I don't know if it's gonna if it's gonna stick, but ever since if you've ever listened to my stuff or um, watched my my videos, that's where I what I talk about. And um, you know, the idea is that price is more of like an an indicator of volume, and not so much the star of the show. And so. Right now, when as as we trade, when we go onto the markets, when we're trading piggies or when we're trading whatever it is, um, especially in the Twitter world, there's this understanding of technical analysis. Like, yeah, sure, you you use it to like make your executions better, um, but really, it's half half of the story. Managing your trades, the psychology of trading, understanding sort of risk, um, uh, our values, and managing your own um your own um performance inside of trades is what the best traders on twitter focus on i think correct me if i'm wrong if you've had a different experience um fine but i think the the opportunities are really lie in in getting away from the idea that that price action is something that you learn and move on from because i think we're not looking at things the right way i think if price is an indicator of volume and if volume is literally only half of the story or maybe even a little part of the story and the rest of the story is about 
the the intent that buyers and sellers have in the market. And I'm talking about, again, those orders that are placed but are not accepted into the market. What they're showing you is intent. When you look at a price chart or when you look at a candlestick chart, you're only seeing the commitment. What, what orders were accepted and it prints a price. And what I'm saying is that that's less important than the, the full picture. And then judging um, judging a technical analysis or, or starting from that baseline. And so if the baseline is completely different, then how does that change the way that you do technical analysis? So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm really gonna try and simplify it. So market auction theory, um, it's a concept that, yeah, A, price is an indicator of volume and volume is like half a story. Um, and then B, that price action or the, the auction process is an expansionist market environment. When price isn't expanding and it's just moving sideways, no one's interested in it in terms of the volatility because it's just not there. No one's interested in, tra um, in trying to take daily cash out of that market. On the option side, if it has a strong sort of options market, Sure, there's going to be people that are making money off of stocks moving sideways because you can do that in, op in the options market. Or there's some sort of derivative. Uh, but when it comes down to participant versus participant, which is where I think uh, traders like you and I do the best, uh, when there's a lot of that fear and there's a lot of volume moving and there's a lot of volatility, there's opportunities that show up for us. And so I think that since participants are instinctively drawn to um, act um, on a, on a name that is maybe has a little bit of like low volume. Um, and as that volume begins to ramp up, price begins to show us the intent of where things are going. Um, and so, uh, the, the, the theory basically states that low volume inside of markets is the most important thing. Um, and stop me please. If, if, if you need clarification on anything. Oh god, this is very interesting. Yeah, high high volume. When you see high volume in uh, a price range, um, you're basically the market is telling you is not telling you, hey, this is an important point. Um, put your stops here, or or this is a great place to jump into the trade. It's not telling you either way which way to go. And this is a misconception that I find. You know, I've done a lot of mentoring. I've worked with a lot of traders. I love teaching. It's one of like my favorite things in the world. Um, and there's this expectation that since there was a lot of people trading at this market peak, let's say like, if you think about the volume profile on the side, um, that because there's so many people that traded there, that this is a, a key point. What I'm saying is that the, the price is telling you that this is where participants have overcommitted. This is, this is, the old news what's most important then if if the old news isn't what's important what i'm saying is that low volume where there the points where there is very little volume is where price will spend the least amount of time and so if you can capture that low volume point you're either going to be ahead of the market or far behind the market but you will never be at the point where uh, buyers and sellers have overcommitted are, are you following so far? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. And so um, the application um, of this sort of puts on its head this idea of support and resistance, which I think is completely overblown. Um, if you look into the order flow and see how, what is support and resist, resistance? Where does that, this idea even come from? Why is it that I'm drawing a line across the chart and thinking that this is going to be an important area? We don't go that deep. We just say, hey, price has hit, you know, peaked against this or flagged in a certain way. The top of that flag is now an important area. But why is it important? It's because when price hits that, that is that line that you've just dropped in as resistance if you're below it or in support if you're above it is, um, is where price is being rejected viciously. And so, um, Modern modern auction theory is the visualization of little workers in the market 
traveling across price, trying to complete volume distributions where there's no, um, where there's very little commitment or low volume nodes, um, there is most likely to be a lot of volatility. And to traders, that's super important because if, if you have um, a take profit that is um, just above a low volume area, it is, it is highly likely that price is going to bounce and either, either completely bounce off and never hit your target, or it's going to completely run through your target and you might get slipped. And so these little decisions, they matter in the, in the long term. I can definitely give you an example. Um, I think uh, in one of our webinars back in the day, I explained it as the, the meat counter. <laughs> Imagine that there's, there's these, um, there's these counters and they're, um, and they're vendors and they're, they're all selling meat. And, um, you know, one vendor has the hottest meat. It's like Wagyu. It's like, it's up there. Everyone's heading over there. There's a big lineup. And then all of a sudden, some dude on the other side says, oh, that guy's got Wagyu. I'm going to drop Wagyu up on my sign. Okay. A line starts starts forming. And then more and more people start going to that lineup. And, and people start forming up there. And just because a, another uh, vendor was popular, all of a sudden, there's going to be this large line that gets bigger and bigger and bigger behind this other vendor not necessarily says that that the the meat's a lot better just that there's a lot of um demand for that area and it looks like there's a trend what what the what market modern auction theory is allowing you to do is sort of block out all of the other garbage that doesn't matter at the time and lets you focus on on identifying um, areas where people want to spend the least amount of time, and so one of the one of the other vendors in the middle has nobody there, um, but you know, based off of the previous price action, that once people start lining up here, um, it has the potential to really become a, an area of interest, and so that's that's sort of the the gist behind it. Um, there's a lot of like application when it comes to price. Um, I'm working on some animations. It's going to be releasing some videos really soon that explain it a little bit better. Um, but I think it's a really uh, nice way to do technical analysis, a little bit of a breath of fresh air compared to the sort of same stuff that we see over and over again. Yeah, as in, it's a way to understand the concepts that create the technical analysis. So, so I was going to ask you, so... Um... How did you come up with all these, uh, the, the auction theory, modern auction, or, you know, is that something like uh, you got from, from many different sources, you kind of made your own version of it? Um, auction, auction market theory is an actual uh, theory or like framework. Um, Jesse Livermore famously uh, yeah, wrote huh. about it. Uh, <clears throat> the Wyckoff method sort of uses uh -huh. principles of it, but there is there is this focus, like very deep focus on price, that I think is um, is um, misplaced. And they wrote this stuff, I think, when it was much more difficult. We didn't have the they didn't have the technology that we do nowadays uh, in order to understand order flow. Uh, that didn't have the depth of market that we have access to right now as well. Uh, and so for them, it is price discovery, high, the high volume nodes, the low volume nodes, the value areas, the market profile, uh, the classic market structure. And they're, they're looking at, this is how people generally like to form up. A flag is a flag because it's developing a high volume node based off of a distribution. That distribution, the peak of it is the high volume node, the HVN, and it is uh, an area where market has found balance, right? That's, and that's as far as they go. And so I think the evolution of that really has to be, what have we learned in the last number of years? And how, how does it change the way we trade? And I think it really has to do with the psychology of, of, of people and how that shows up 
inside of the order flow. Gotcha. Awesome. Really good stuff, man. Uh, I can't wait. What I can't wait for this thing to be published. So are you, uh, <laughs> when are you coming out? Oh, but you have a sub stack in the meantime. Right? Yeah, I gotta, I've got to finish it soon. I'm not keeping up with Substack. I'm not keeping up with YouTube. Um, <laughs> I've been all over crypto and um, yeah, I've just been doing this sort of long-term longer term trading so that my my crypto trade on ethereum was from 2017 to 2024 <laughs> oh you closed it out okay wow no no um, sorry i that was 20 percent of it i i closed out the rest uh we'll see what happens okay nice oh either way that's that's huge um great so so dell uh how can people get a hold of you this, these days yeah definitely on twitter at dell the trader um, look out on YouTube at Della Trader. And, um, if you want, go ahead and sign up to my sub stack. I might one night decide to write something. Um, but yeah, really just reach out if you want to say hi, or if you have any questions around or ideas around what I'm, what I'm doing, happy to, happy to have anyone else pitch in, including yourself. If you have any ideas or if I've awoken Absolutely. anything or yeah. just let me know. Cool. All right, Dell. Well, it's been great connecting and yeah, we'll keep in touch. All right, David, thanks so much for your time, man. Appreciate See it. You, man. Good luck in the markets. For sure. All right.